Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff Leifer, and I have the pleasure to help facilitate um, a conversation today with three executive leaders of a wonderful nonprofit group located in Spain. And the group's name is ICERS, I C E E R S. And, and ICERS uh, stands for the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Research, and Service. And I'll just very quickly touch on who we have with us today. And you can look at the ICERS website and see their full bio, which is really worth checking out. Um, first, Ben Delonen, uh, who's a filmmaker, an advocate, and uh, an, an all around change maker on the international level. Um, in, in 2009, Ben founded the ICERS organization, <clears throat> which is a charitable nonprofit. You know, what's interesting about ICERS to me is that it has this, this very unique United Nations uh, consultative status where, um, and we're going to talk about a, a little bit about that work uh, and how ICERS uh, works at the highest levels of advocacy as well as at the grassroots level. Um, so, so Benjamin serves as the executive director and has authored several publications and films. Uh, he's presented at conferences around the world and has participated in various leadership roles, including as a member of the board of directors of something called the Global Ibogaine Game Therapist Alliance. Let me also introduce Natalia Riboyo. Um, and uh, Natalia has a lot of experience with traditional medicine and shamanism and, and is a scholar in, in, in those spaces and those fields. Um, she worked extensively with indigenous communities in Mexico, and she's currently serving as the coordinator of the Ayahuasca Legal Defense Fund, which is a premier program um, of ICERS. And finally, to introduce uh, Oscar Perez, uh, who is currently the deputy director of ICERS. And Oscar promotes educational drug reform and research projects on a variety of um, modalities uh, across a spectrum of uh, geographical spaces. And we're gonna get into that today. He's also um, working on research projects uh, around something called uh, the social clubs. And we'll, we'll talk about that, and why that um, is able to allow broad access, but with accountability, um, which is an important piece of ICIR's program. And so um, Oscar is also the organizer of the World Ayahuasca Conference which is a, a really significant international gathering of over a thousand um, stakeholders in the, in the ecosystem. So welcome, Benjamin, Natalia, and, and Oscar. It's a real honor to be in conversation with you and um, bring this important uh, work to the communities, particularly of uh, the K-Dome, the Infinite Playa, and the Ketamine Research Foundation, as well as of the other folks that want to want to jump in with us. I think before we start, I'd just like to maybe read uh, the short one sentence vision statement that uh, ICERS has on, on their website. So you have a little bit of context about, about this important work. And, and it goes like this. We envision a future where psychoactive plant practices are valued and integrated parts of society. It's simple and it's powerful. And the, the core values read like this, environmental sustainability, honoring cultural diversity, respect for indigenous and spiritual traditions, human rights approach, transparency and integrity, evidence-based decision-making, reducing risks and harms and maximizing benefits, and respectful, engaged, and collaborative relationships. So that, that's a little bit of uh, the context of the important work that, um, that ICERS has been deeply engaged in since 2009. So <clears throat> Benjamin, maybe as, a, as just an opening overview, one of the things that's just fascinating to me about ICERS and has been so effective is, is, is the fact that you're working and engaged with uh, institutions and organizations as significant as the United Nations, 
<clears throat> and yet engaged at a grassroots level with these social clubs and working in decriminalization and working with uh, indigenous communities and cosmologies. That's not very common uh, in, in North America where, where I'm uh, chiming in from in Northern California uh, and you all are in Spain. Uh, and it's not really very common anywhere in the world. So perhaps you could speak to how you're able to do it um, and how it, how it came to be like that and why you, why you feel it's been so effective. Yeah, I think ICIRS is an organization that's really in kind of the liminal space between all of these words, worlds that you've mentioned. Uh, and I think that is important because we're working around plants that come from traditions with different worldviews. Uh, that are globalizing no? and, and meeting kind of our, the, the global north in our, our ways of thinking here. Um, and because there's such a rich cultural diversity and, and when we talk about, for example, ayahuasca, we're not just only talking about, you know, a, a plant substance and, and, and therapy or uh, individual use. We're really talking about many, many things like, for example, uh, territory, uh, you know, connection to nature, indigenous rights you know it's, it's a very broad and complex uh, subject that we work and that's why it's so so important to work at these different levels and be able to detect opportunities and think always from a collective impact perspe uh, perspective uh, so it's you know we in that sense of what you're saying is it's not such a lineal kind of strategy you know you start from a and then you arrive in z because of the nature of the plants and, and the, the diversity and complexity. Uh, it's important to develop new narratives, to engage in partnerships that are, you know, uh, in intercultural and interdisciplinary. Uh, and, and through that advance towards the world that we want to see, you know, and the world we want to see is one where uh, it's not just uh, kind of, you know, only a, a plant that's, uh, you know, available to a, a specific audience, within a specific uh, context, for example, psychedelic medicalization, which is a biomedical framing, but where we see that type of access within a, a broad spectrum of uh, different um, accesses and recognition of ancestral, uh, you know, system that, that surround these, these plants. Um, you know, you have the churches, the religions. So to, to make sure that all of those different uh, systems of use have their place, uh, and, um, you know, where we can move towards maximum safety, maximum ethics, accountability, uh, strong collectives, um, and really kind of, you know, move towards the, the core uh, issues that we are facing as humanity. And now more with COVID, which is really, I think, uh, obliging us to, um, you know, become one and, and really think as one in, in dealing with, with those challenges. I really appreciate this, uh, Benjamin, because uh, well, traditional nonprofit structure is often around sort of one cause or campaigning around a certain advocacy uh, platform. And what I keep hearing about ICERs is, oh, they're an ally for us in the Middle East. They're an ally for us in Northern Europe. They're an ally for us in Africa. Um, they're an ally for us, you know, on the front lines of decriminalization. Uh, medicalization and so it just sounds like that you with the nimbleness of the organization your team has been able to facilitate sort of communication at the hub of these different ecosystems modeling in in many ways the nonlinearity of the healing uh, technology if you will the healing uh, system that these ancient um, in, in the case of the indigenous these ancient ways have always been held and offered, and yet, and I guess we'll talk about this later, um, we are seeing it united with modern Western technology. Uh, and, and it sounds like that can't really be done unless there's somebody at the intersection of these, uh, these ecosystems. So it does sound like there's sort of a nimbleness and a facilitative um, role, and yet at the same time, uh, a role as an ally. Does that sound like a, a fair representation? Yeah, and I think the World Ayahuasca Conference is a good example of where, you know, the, the name says World Ayahuasca Conference uh, and also the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. You know, one might think, and we get that feedback, that uh, it's actually, you know, why only about ayahuasca? It's so limited. Uh, you know, Natalia can say a bit more about the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, which 
be called like that because many of the cases were about ayahuasca mostly in the beginning, but it's really about the, you know broader plant medicine. But then at the conference, the experience that people had was that actually kind of the ayahuasca or the, the plant medicine is a connector, uh, you know, brings people of different backgrounds of different, uh, you know, knowledge and expertise together. Uh, you know, we did a, a policy uh, meeting there, for example, and there were people from drug policy, from human rights, working in indigenous rights in Amazon conservation, kind of all of these different perspectives and what they have in common is an interest in ayahuasca. But it's by, you know, kind of the ayahuasca really as a vine connects all of those perspectives and elevates our collective understanding of, of the issues that we have hand, hand. So for sure, we, we are a convener. Uh, we convene different stakeholders so that we can mutually en enrich our, our um, you know, understanding of, of the matter and in a broad sense. Uh, and at the same time, we always try to think, you know, 10 years ahead and a lot of our thinking also around psychedelic medicalization, you know, where psychedelics are put in a, in a biomedical model, which is now, you know, most of the funding and, you know, so the for-profit world is now very much invested in that, in that vision. For us, it's like, okay, that's, that's kind of a step, but really, you know, what comes 10 years later, uh, if we really want to tackle the, the issues that we have uh, in the world at the, at the, you know, at the core uh, and moving from a, a revolution in psychiatry to really a, a revolution in health in the in the broad sense of the world and you can only do that when you understand the interconnectedness and uh, how all of these different perspectives can can come together um, so, um, so and you know another example is like drug policy uh, has all of their narratives and their ways of thinking and when you focus on plants where you know that come from ancient traditions that still are alive today bringing in narratives from that space also can then help uh, you know broaden uh, the views uh, of the drug policy world uh, and the same in other areas no in health and, and others so, mm -hmm. so that's what we try to do really innovating and, and convening dialogue um, beautiful i'd like to bookmark that uh, and come back to <clears throat> decriminalization uh, and medicalization uh, and talk to oscar in a minute but Let's let's jump to Natalia for a second, and then we'll come back um, because you you know you referred to the Ayahuasca Legal Defense Fund, and and you you made some reference to legality. And Natalia, perhaps you could outline for us uh, the defense fund and how it operates. You're a lawyer uh, and an advocate, uh, but also just uh, maybe maybe give us a, a quick update on the state of legality with with the different modalities and the. The different parts of the world and 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 uh and then we'll we'll get back to talking about what's going on in spain and how a lot of what's happening in spain could be a model for the world it's uh, it's been a journey also through the ayahuasca defense fund as also ben said the name sometimes suggests that we are somehow um uh, not including other plants but of course we've we, of course we had ayahuasca in the first place then we have psilocybin mushrooms then in the third place we have uh, San Pedro or Peyote and then coca leaf in that order. Um, so the, the legal status of ayahuasca is somehow uncertain and all depends um, where we I mean where we're located. All of the legal incidents that we've had throughout this time which are around 152, 153 incidents at the moment um, it's an opportunity to know what is the legal status of ayahuasca because sometimes we don't know. As far as we know only France has included the both botanical names of the plants of ayahuasca into the, the drug list. Um, other than France, the legal status is uncertain. What happens is sometimes different countries or, or judges, wherever they, they receive one of these cases, tend to reduce all the complexity of ayahuasca just to DMT, as well as other substances, the, the psilocybin mushrooms only to psilocybin, peyote only to mescaline, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so whenever we have a legal incident, it's when we have an, a really opportunity to bring forward all the scientific evidence, to bring all the, all the legal arguments around human rights, um, around not only seeing these plants as the molecular compounds that they have, they might be scheduled, but sometimes um, whenever we work with the United Nations, we then confirm that the only three plants that are scheduled under international law are the opium puppy, marijuana, 
and coca leaf. Other than those three plants, they're not uh, considered under control under international law. So this helps a lot to shed light into other countries and then see exactly what is the legal status. So at the moment, um, sometimes it's not legal, sometimes it's not illegal. So mm -hmm. it's in this gray zone where that's where the ADF can, you know, um, come in and then of course help um, through, through, through all the legal process to, to, to bring clarity on what is the legal status. So we have, we've set a lot of good precedents in different countries, like in Chile, of course in Spain, where judges have demonstrated that um, it's not only they're not only scheduled under national laws, but they're also good for public health. Mm, beautiful. So that's the legal status. It's a gray zone. Okay. So question, um, is it true that sometimes a case like, let's say in France, that ICRs will scramble to, you know, stand side by side uh, with uh, with a carrier or someone that's involved in a case, and then we'll translate the transcripts and then share that with folks in a different country entirely, and that that's had influence with a judge because there was precedent even though it was in another country. Is that something that's effective? Exactly, and that actually it helps a lot that we've been able to connect um, the ways some progressive judges have thought or their impressions on the results in a sentence or maybe in a decision. Um, so this somehow opens you know, the, the criteria uh, into the decision makers to also consider other ways of, of estimating these plans. So we, that, that's a lot of our, the work that we do. We just, we're connecting different jurisdictions and saying, just open, open yourself and just not only try, to, try this as a criminal issue rather than considering other human rights, considering other elements in the national domestic law. Um, they might also, you know, provide a good solution for, for a case. So even in France at the moment, which is, you know, a, a place where it's really challenging, we're, we, we, we're defending a legal case at the moment. And, you know, I always say that this, this cases, we win with science. It's scientific evidence. Um, so it's a, re a really beautiful connection between law, which was really divided from science, which is somehow in these cases coming together again. Interesting. So it sounds like the very intentional um, shaping uh, of ICRs itself as an organization um, to give context to these seemingly disparate ecosystems, but in fact, a lot of intersecting and overlapping core values and uh, sort of orientation and uh, really uh, approach to integrative healing. It sounds like the way that ICERS uh, creates a context for this, frankly, worldwide um, integrated uh, ecosystem of healing and integration is something that ICERS has been able to bring in specific legal cases to kind of awaken a judge's uh, awareness and consciousness about how to look at a case rather than the usual very linear prescriptive, this is a drug case. It becomes contextualized in, in a larger way. And from my understanding, some of the judges have, have even said to prosecutors, these people are doing healing work and, and I'm seeing a lot of transformative results. Uh, I don't understand why you're prosecuting it in this way. You better go back and do your homework. Is that apocryphal or is that true what I've heard? That's absolutely true. It all, of course, it all depends also um, in, I mean, which country we're talking about, but sometimes also judges won't go that fur further. I mean, they, they won't want to set a precedent or be very innovative in the way they d decide about these cases. But in the broader sense, of course, this is this is exactly what is happening. There's a bit better understanding of what this is about. And every case is also a really good opportunity for education. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's, let's shift a little bit uh, because it brings up an obvious and important point at the heart of ICIR's cosmology. And, and value, you know, proposition, mission statement, which is, well, can we keep the, these cases out of the courts in the first place? Uh, that would be really powerful. And so, Oscar, I'd love to, to hear a bit from you. Um, you've been so deeply involved in, in the decriminalization of drug policy. Um, I know from speaking with, with your team that even in the case of Catalonia, 
uh, working at the grassroots level, which is, uh, you know, often not considered the way to change policy or to create advocacy. Uh, and then, and then if you look what's going on around the world, including in North America, there's social uprising. It's happening. Uh, in, in many re regards, particularly around uh, inequalities, uh, systemic racism, um, the acute uh, effects of COVID uh, and how it affects marginalized populations, but particularly around drug policy. Can you talk a little bit about decriminalization uh, and then and, and, and how Catalonia and, and, and other examples in Spain might be a model for, for how we might be able to shape this in, in, in other parts of the world? Yes, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Um, I would like to go a bit uh, back and say that somehow ICIRS has flourished here in Catalonia, in Barcelona, for some precedents that uh, make the, the conditions to, to be able to, to connect all these dots and to be involved in these different scenes. And I will uh, comment uh, a couple of, of, of them, but I will go deeper on, on the decriminalization uh, point. But uh, first, I want to mention that because of Spain um, has a strong connection with uh, South America because of the language and the history, here is, was one of the first places where ayahuasca landed in the late 90s. So, for example, I had the chance to drink ayahuasca with 17 years in the 1998 here in Barcelona, and it was not the first group that was doing that. So, uh, ICERS. Uh, Ben came here in 2009-10, so there were already a decade of, of, of movements of people uh, self-organizing or inviting indigenous representatives as well. So somehow this scene was going on. A lot of people uh, had to fight a lot to, to open this uh, arena so others, so for example, as we can come and do another work, but we are very, very connected to the people who was before in this scene. And the other fact is the political one. So it's uh, both are socio-political somehow, but uh, Spain is not a high degree democracy that has done very progressive change in drug policy. It's maybe the opposite. Uh, we had 40 years of dictatorship um, that it ended in the late 70s because of Franco. Mm -hmm. So uh, Spain was somehow a part of Europe when the UN conventions were agreed. So Spain came late to these agreements, international agreements, and didn't do it at all. So they simply did not criminalize consumption. I see. So the sale uh, is, is criminalized, but not the consumption. So somehow this lead uh, that society uh, self-organized in some aspects. I will, will explain a bit about the cannabis social clubs and other clubs because they are ayahuasca social clubs as well. But uh, maybe what happened in a wider uh, scale in, in all Spain, it's that uh, Spain is divided in regions and some regions, they own some uh, competences, for example, health. So some of the regions were more progressive and took some steps in this decriminalization path. So this opened the field for all the harm reduction. We were the first in, uh, well, not the first, but some of the first in Europe in offer methadone in the in the 80s middle exchange um middle exchange programs in prisons which is some something that is not done many parts of the world and this happened 30 years ago here wow. so uh, there was a culture that made people understand that drugs are somehow connected to public health not only to security and governments put money in those kind of programs, also in very interest, interesting nightlife programs with very interesting um, drug checking um, programs at um, at the rave scenes or in, in party scenes. So this has been over for 20 years also and has mm. inspired uh, other movements all, all over the world. And finally, for example, we have 15 drug consumption rooms in the city of Barcelona in each of the districts. So there's not other parts of the world with this. Uh, uh, this availability of, of such spaces, even though uh, it still has lots of things to, to improve. Uh, for example, we, we are working with the uh, uh, grassroots movement of uh, wom women that use drugs. We are helping them from ISERS. And in the center of Barcelona, there's nowadays one project called Medzineras, which is really um, doing, going next step 
uh, driven by users, uh, only women and LGBT oh. as well um, uh, population. But somehow mm, Catalonia has been a lab and ICIRS can has bring the new lab inside this lab that allow us to, to connect uh, and to experiment with those uh, types of experiences. And afterwards, not because of the government, so a part of the government, civil society organized uh, surrounding cannabis. Uh, Spain is the gate of uh, entering of all the uh, Morocco hashish. Morocco is the first producer of hashish in the world and it's the first uh, seller and it all comes from through Spain. So in the 90s, a group of people decided that they wanted to get out of the logic of the black market and self-organize. So they say, okay, as it is not criminalized, I can have my plant. We will uh, make a group of 100 people. Each one will put one plant on the crop and we will have 200 plants. So this was the first collective uh, uh, grow movement in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And 30 years after, we have 1,200 clubs, social clubs opening every day in Spain. And the club is a new step because it's not only organize a, a one collective crop. It's also hiring a place where the community that is doing that production can do the distribution and can self-organize. But there are some rules. And one important rule is that you cannot do profit. So it's community-driven projects without profit. So uh, it's not focusing on selling more. It's focusing more in creating culture and on generating uh, new responses to the failure of the prohibition system regarding cannabis. And it, I have to say that although it's not illegal, it's not totally regulated, so bad practices can happen and also um, mafia can try to take its part. So we are on this path of helping grassroots movements to, to get the regulation they deserve to stop the repression and um, how what one we can shift these learnings from cannabis, for example, to ayahuasca. Uh, there are nowadays uh, uh, a few ayahuasca social clubs, which is more or less the same uh, idea. It's a reduced group of people that self-organize how they uh, receive the, the substance and how they distribute it. And it's a closed circuit. It cannot be, um, you cannot advertise it. You cannot make profit. And these learnings, these experiences is the field where we are and what we try to learn, what we try to bring our perspective and also connect it with uh, other scenes all around. Wow, beautiful, Oscar. This is uh, such a refreshing um, outlook and such important work. I just want to acknowledge how challenging it is to adhere to the core value of inclusivity and accessibility and diversity. It's, it's, it's bandied about a lot because it's very trendy. Uh, and there's all sorts of, uh, frankly, legacy organizations, including nonprofit organizations that are pivoting right now because of what's in the zeitgeist and because it's very, um, the social uprising is bringing it to uh, the forefront. But ICIRS has had this at the heart of its cosmology for a decade now. And it's, a, it's, it's just really uh, inspiring. And I'll say that many have been critical uh, of certain efforts here in North America over the past couple of decades uh, around medicalization. And I wanna segue with you into a bit about medicalization, but just to say that this inclusivity piece, this uh, diversity piece in and the role of the grassroots. This is not something that comes easily uh, over here in, in North America. There are some initiatives, you know, MAPS has an expanded access program, et cetera. But for the most part, there are many, many people concerned about psychedelic medicine ecosystem in North America and in, in sort of the, the, the very first developed parts of the world becoming an elitist, primarily uh, white European uh, male dominated ecosystem and getting into the very same uh, inequality problems we have with a very, very distorted and unequal healthcare system. So we're inviting major course correction. And we also have big pharma 
which has typically um, often an extractive profit model around mental health and healthcare. So just to say uh, props and acknowledgement of what ITSEERS has been doing for a decade. And maybe if you just wouldn't mind segueing a bit into uh, medicalization and then, and then, you know, I'll let Benjamin come in and pick up on that a bit because it, because the medicalization effort, the way that ICERS holds it, is broad enough to include multiple uses, multiple modalities, multiple geographic ecosystems, and even a place for the indigenous. And that kind of reciprocity and that kind of alliance, we don't, we're not seeing that, quite honestly, very much in North America, and we need to. And, and can I can I just uh, add a bit to what, what uh, Please, Oscar was saying? Yeah, you know, like working with the grassroots and and helping uh, collectives organize and become strong voices. Um, you know, that that's something which at the Catalan level there's so much experience over many many years, you know, and, and we've been involved in. But then also we have seen that that's something we could bring to other countries. And you know, just like for example, Chinese medicine practitioners in California at some point. Uh, all recognize that this is potentially dangerous if it's not done right, no? if the needles aren't clean or there's no standards of, of safety. Uh, they came together, they self-organized, and then out of self-regulation came full regulation. No? And, uh, and so this is something which we have brought to uh, plant medicine in, in different um, countries, understanding that either the illegality or the gray zone, which is the situation in most countries, as Natalia pointed out, really isolates people and uh, it, and it avoids information to flow and people to learn from each other, from each other's mistakes and from each other's uh, expertise. Um, and so that's, and so when you bring all of those people together and they start to self-organize, to learn from each other, to become a strong collective that upholds, um, you know, uh, responsibility, collective responsibility, systems of accountability, uh, then, then really you elevate of that whole collective, um, you know, the the practice, no, and and um, safety, thinking about inclusivity, ethics, and, and other uh, aspects. And so, uh, out of that work, one uh, again very um, you know pioneering thing which happened in Catalonia was that then in our uh, engagement with the health authorities in Catalonia, which we have a good, very good relationship. They commissioned a report, which was which is a report for uh, best practices on ayahuasca. It's called Better Ceremonial Ayahuasca Practices for uh, Ceremony Organizers and Participants. And this was published by the health authorities in Catalonia, and they knew that this all came out of engagement and and community building with the practitioners' communities there. No, and and for me also that's kind of a next level of harm and risk reduction because. I mean, you know, when the, those collectives become responsible and they have their safety standards and they do good screening and there's a support structure for people who need uh, continued care, uh, you know, that's the way you avoid uh, problems for many, many more people than just informing uh, participants of ceremonies. No? And so we hope that that also that work, uh, you know, as out of the lab can move to other parts of, of the world and. Um, yeah, and ideally at the end point, create professional guilds of uh, practitioners of a broad, broad variety of uh, cultural backgrounds, but with the same ethics, the same safety standards that they agree on, uh, and a com combined efforts for uh, support structures, no? for uh, integration services or dealing with adverse situations. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it sounds like you've really been able to form some loose, loose net um, coalitions, if you will, and collectives where policymakers, decision makers, as well as um, grassroots uh, leaders um, and, and uh, initiatives stand in solidarity with each other in service to the same goals. This is a, a model of co-creation that really this kind of healing work I think demands if it's to be sustainable. We've seen particularly uh, in the 60s and you know we've seen a backlash from the status quo because of fear uh, and because of uh, wrong-headed government uh, repression. We've seen sometimes this research pushed underground and, 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 and had a real missed opportunity for decades around mental health and healing and by doing it this way 
you're you're, you're creating solidarity, but uh, in, in, in alliances, but also uh, inviting the cultivation of agency by all stakeholders, and that that ensures really a long-term vision. Do you want to say anything more about uh, medicalization at this point? Uh, sure. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, like, so, you know, the medicalization process, uh, the fact that MAPS has been working for now 30 years, uh, and the fact that there's examples of doing it in a nonprofit way, I think is deeply inspiring uh, and will, and, and really is a revolution in psychiatry. Um, you know, this like, uh, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is really connecting psychiatry with psychotherapy. Uh, you know, around compounds that we all know have very powerful, um, you know, impacts on, on people. Um, so, you know, moving psychedelics into that context and then hopefully in an inclusive way, uh, you know, that's, that's a very important advancement. But I think when we talk about plant medicine, um, you know, the question really is, are we missing out a lot when we take out, uh, you know, a, a plant, a traditional plant out of a, you know, very complex uh, systems and understanding of health, uh, and then putting it in a biomedical uh, model, which we, we know also has its limitations. Um, and so, you know, I think thinking of the, the crisis in the little time that we have, um, you know, we, it's kind of COVID is like no bullshit time, no? We need, we need to be efficient and we need, really need to go to the core of the, of the matter. And so what, what I hope to see is, uh, instead of kind of extracting ayahuasca and, you know, and peyote and so forth out of these, these cultures, that we can actually transform our understanding of, of health by creating alliances, no? and um, where the biomedical understanding of health is one. Um, but if you have a, an organism that's uh, sick, you want to have you know, all of the experts of different disciplines and different worldviews coming together so that all together they weave um, you know, the understanding and get a, a holistic view of what's wrong and then be able to uh, address it from, from the core. And I personally don't believe that you, you can really create a, a revolution in mental health um, by just putting those plans in a biomedical uh, model. Um, it, really, really you know, it, it really transforms things towards understanding the interconnectedness between the individual, community, the environment, and a lot of those indigenous systems um you know they they have a lot of that other knowledge you know? so i think bridge bridge building uh and and really coming together as allies and not a, as kind of colonial relationships is really what's needed um you know for us to transform it's such a refreshing perspective benjamin and i've heard you speak to i think it's the the potency of this moment where we're all facing the same challenge if you will at the biological level teaching us and reminding us that we're bi biological species living on this planet together. That interconnectedness is at the heart of these cosmologies that you're speaking to. So it's not about holding precious the indigenous and traditional ways. It's about understanding why these modalities have been so effective, if I understand you correctly. I, I've heard you say, you know, that Yahe, for instance, and Ayahuasca are, are rooted in the spirit of place and that they come to us through these indigenous uh, lineal uh, slipstreams and, and, you know, traditions, and that, that unless we walk in solidarity with the people uh, who steward the, the, um, the medicines, we can't really be connected to the plant. And, 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 and I think the final thing that I, I want to ask about that I've heard you say is that um, the medicines in, in many communities, uh, Yahe in particular, isn't necessarily taken just for the spiritual, psycho-spiritual growth of the individual but actually for the collective and the continuity of these communities within a larger ecosystem. I think that's such a powerful model and a little bit hard for the Western mind to grok fully in how to apply that to our current contemporary desire for uh, integrity in the psychedelic medicine ecosystem. Yeah, and you know, and I've been for many years trying to figure out what is the connection between indigenous, uh, you know, the kind of the indigenous world and the role of plant medicine in those contexts. And in the West, I always saw them as, you know, yes, we, we need to uh, help preserve the cultures and the, the, the people, uh, but that those are kind of two different worlds. And it's not until I really, you know, got deeply into, um, you know, visiting some of these communities and firsthand discovering, um, you know, some of these very complex, like the Shipibo 
the ETA system. It's a very, very highly com complex kind of surgery system almost, uh, you know, dealing with trauma in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else uh, done in wow. such a sophisticated way. And that's just one system. Uh, so I've come to see, you know, like if all of those experts, it's like in a hospital, you know, you have the, the, the surgeons and you have the nutrition experts and, you know, the general practitioners and the psychiatrists, they all come together uh, over one patient and they're now all seeing the interconnectedness of the, the symptoms and getting to the root cause. You know, that's something we need to do at the global level. And, you know, what's more powerful when, you know, we overcome our differences and, and with a mindset of curiosity come together with a blank slate and say, okay, what do we need to do together? And, create new epistemologies and, and, and from that place start the work. Uh, and I think with the same money that it would take to develop uh, medicine through the FDA or, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, drug development context, you know, we could do very, very powerful things as well, uh, you know, in, in collaboration. And then... I hear you saying, Ben, sorry to cut you off, but just to get this point, I hear you saying that the science and the research and the technology of, of the North, um, just in the way, say, like the Pachamama Alliance talks about the alliance of the North and the South, you know, the prophecy of the condor and the eagle. I hear you saying that very specifically with the psychoactive plant medicine ecosystem, there's an opportunity here to, to work with the science and with the data, as we are in King's College in England and with MAPS and USONA and Hefter, et cetera, Ketamine Research Foundation. But I hear you saying that these two pieces must be bridged and integrated uh, it's not just the science and the data, uh, that the science, it doesn't take uh, superiority over mythos or culture or, or the, you know, music and, and, and song traditions and the oral traditions, but stands side by side to create an integrated healing modality that, that, that is emerging. That's what I'm hearing you say. Exactly. And then, you know, how do some of those worldviews, you know, I mean, when I heard that the end for say a kofan, the, the individual, the community and the environment is really one and the same thing and healing happens on all of those levels. You know, first I thought well, it's a beautiful idea, but then, you know, I kind of started to really understand more as I got familiar and went through those systems. But, you know, for example, Natalia, maybe we can talk a little bit about the rights of nature, no? which is, you know, what if you take that concept like nature, you know, is really on its own, you know, the whole living organism, we're part of that. And, you know, how do you, you know, what if laws become uh, shaped uh, on those, that worldview and not just nature as a, you know, consumer product for, you know, for, for humans, no? And, right, to monetize. <laughs> <clears throat> Natalia, please, that, that's, that's such a spot on uh, segue. Yes, and there's something about uh, what was Ben was saying about just extracting the molecules, which is repeating the same way of thinking that nature belongs to us rather than we belonging to nature. Mm. There's also another part of the polypharmacology of the components, right? That these plants are so intelligent and they have their own ways of uh, operating. When it's just extracting one molecule, uh, you might lose others that we don't know much about them. Mm -hmm. So there's something about just respecting the whole, you know, ambiance around the plant. Um, and as, as Ben said, we've seen it with indigenous communities that sometimes it's not only about the plant, but it's also about the community healing, mm. um, you know, itself as one body, mm. as one energetic soul, which, um, if one person has a mental illness or a spiritual illness, then the whole community is, is ill. <laughs> I think Oh boy, they're excited. I think this speaks to, um, I mean, really at the highest level, it speaks to Gaia theory. It speaks to the integrative nature of, of all life and of attunement with the flows of life. So I really so appreciate this. And I know there's so much going on. There was a big conference in Ecuador about the rights of nature because they have actually in their constitution acknowledged this important element. Mm -hmm. And I Sears has really worked deeply to, to promote this and to support it. These are, deeply important point. So it's very trendy to talk about integration, uh, but yet at the same time, we're saying let's extract these molecules and work with them and have these peak experiences and then somehow we're going to integrate. Um, well, it's, you know, that's, that's a 
mental construct of coming from me doing the integration rather than the, the plant and the integrated cosmology integrating me, if you will, because I am not separate from nature as, an, as a human and the human system is not separate from the natural system. I think we're getting, we're getting close, um, but uh, we still have a, a couple of minutes. This is, this is a significant point. Uh, ben, what else can we um, maybe uh, point out is sort of at the, t at the, at the top level of, of uh, priority for ICERs um, these days, given, given mm -hmm. the upside downness of the world, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I also the opportunity. I think we've touched upon uh, most things. No? I mean, I think our research and our, our policy work, uh, kind of it's all in service of, of that bigger, bigger vision. Um, I mean, one thing I really hope is that because it seems like in the U.S. now, uh, you know, it's obviously is a country that is, uh, you know, very much pushed the prohibition model, where now a lot of change is happening also, again, from the grassroots and the whole decrim nature movement uh, and larger decriminalization is, a, is an example of that. For these ballot initiatives, no, and uh, so I, I really hope that we can, you know, from a small country in Spain, where you know maybe sounds like a far away, you know, it's not not much to do with the U.S. Uh, that we can be of service in 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 bringing that knowledge. We like to connect the dots and what we learn in, you know, in our our back garden lab uh, to be able to to bring that to others. Uh, and in in Spain, really, the, the, this this association model, this community model came about also because they recognize something which is called um, shared personal use, where you understand that when, when people come together as a collective to have a ceremony together, that that's still personal use. No? And, uh, so I really hope that those type of concepts, for example, can be uh, become integrated in the way decriminalization is uh, focused uh, or g given shape in, in the US. Um, and yeah, and, and again, kind of with all of the work, you know, in organizing collectives from the bottom up, uh, that, that all of the things that we learn, and we learn so much from those processes, it's that, that's really what it's about, you know, mutual learning in all directions, that those lessons can, can serve, um, you know, in, in, in kind of other countries no? where, where Absolutely. collectives are trying to make change. Um, Beautiful. I, I so appreciate... Uh, you, Benjamin, and, and Oscar, and Natalia, and your entire team really encourage everybody to go to the ICERS website to, to get involved, to support the, the work that's being done around COVID, around the, the Legal Defense Fund. Um, resources are obviously needed, but uh, this isn't a pitch. This is more about solidarity, standing in solidarity in the way that ICERS has for, for so many. Uh, I, I invite uh, us all to stand in solidarity with you and just say thank you for your beautiful work. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thank you guys so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, more to come. Cheers. <laughs> I love it. Take care.